So in preparation for the analysis of a device-independent protocol for quantum key distribution that we're going to see in the next videos, in this video I'd like to revisit a theme that you already explored in week 2, which is the possibility of using a non-local game in order to test for entanglement. In, in particular, you saw how the CHSH game could be used to test for the presence of an EPR pair. So let's look at this a little bit more closely. So let me remind you of the CHSH game first. So this is a game played between two parties, Alice and Bob. Alice is provided an input, x in 0, 1. Bob is also provided an input, y in 0, 1. These two parties, or I'll call them boxes, Alice and Bob, may share an untangled state, ho b, that I have no information about. Depending on their input, they each perform an arbitrary measurement on their share of the state, and they obtain outputs a in 0, 1, and b in 0, 1. And now the winning condition is evaluated. And what the winning condition for CHSH says is that the parity of their outputs should be equal to the AND of the inputs, which I can always rewrite as the product of x and y. So their maximum winning of probability is the maximum average of these probabilities when I average over a pair of inputs, x and y, chosen uniformly at random, and I sum over all outputs that satisfy the CHSH criterion. Now, for purposes of analysis, I want to rewrite this probability of winning in a slightly different way. So you can always rewrite it in this way. It's equal to a half plus one eighth. These are just normalization factors times this big expression here. So what's the expression? Psi here is the state that they share, psi AB. I can always assume, so it's the same as Ho, I can always assume that Ho is a pure state just by giving Alice or Bob a purification of the state. And now what these A0, B0, A1 and B1 are here, they're observables associated with Alice and Bob's measurements. What does this mean? Well, let's take for instance A0. A0 is equal to A0, 0 minus A0, 1. What are these? These are the POVM operators associated with Alice's measurement on input 0. And just as we purified the state that Alice and Bob share, we can also purify these P of Ms and assume that they're actually projective measurements. That's an assumption we can always make without loss of generality. So in that case, it means that this A0,0 and A0,1 are two orthogonal projections. So when I take their difference, I get a Hermitian matrix whose eigenvalues are just plus 1 and minus 1s. In particular, we'll have the condition that I'm going to use later on that A0 squared is the identity. So this is the meaning of these operators A0, A1, B0, B1 that appear in the expression. I didn't quite explain how you go from the first line to the second line, but if you use this definition and if you just write down what this probability is as a function of the observables and the state, then you can go from the first line to the second line. It's not a very long uh, computation. All right, so what you also saw is that the maximum probability of winning in the CHSH game is equal to a half plus one by two over root two. If you remember, this is approximately equal to 0.85. That's the best quantum strategy. You saw that the best classical strategy was equal to three quarters. You also saw what the optimum quantum strategy is, and you saw that that strategy involves using a state, psi AB, which is equal to an EPR pair that will denote phi plus AB. This is just 1 by root 2, 0, 0, plus 1 by root 2, 1, 1. And you saw the optimal measurements. So for Alice, it corresponded to measuring in the computational basis when her input is 0, and the Hadamard basis when her input is 1. And the observables associated with measurements in these bases their A0 is equal to the Z observable, I'm sorry, which is just 1 minus 1. That's the observable. Indeed, it squares to identity. And A1 is the X observable, which is equal to 0, 1, 1, 0. Similarly, you saw that uh, for Bob, the observable is just the Hadamard matrix, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. That's an H. And for B1, I'll call it uh, the flipped Hadamard matrix I don't know that there's a standard notation for this one, so I'll just call it H tilde, and this is equal to 1 minus 1 minus 1 minus 1. So this is an optimal strategy for the CHSH game. And the question that I'm asking in this video is, is there a converse? Can we say something about strategies that achieve the optimum in terms of their structure?
Is this the only optimal strategy or maybe there exists some others? Is it necessary that the state that is shared is an EPR pair or could you be using another state in order to win with probability 0.85 in this game? So the answer is no and let's try to see why. So let's look at our maximum winning probability and let's put bounds on this maximum winning probability. So the first thing that I can do is I can say, well, um, whatever measurements Alice and Bob are performing, once I fix their measurements, it's clear what the best state they should use. They should just look at this operator here. It's an operator that acts on the tensor product of their Hilbert spaces and take a vector psi that's an eigenvector of this operator associated with the largest eigenvalue. That will give me the largest possible value in this expression. And if this is what I take, then the expression will evaluate to half plus one eight times the norm of the operator. So this is the operator norm, largest singular value. So let's look at this operator a little bit more closely. Let me call it the CHSH operator. Let's compute the square of this operator. So this is a big matrix. I don't know what it is, but I'm squaring it. And I'm going to skip the calculation a little bit for you here, but using only the relation that these are observables, so the square to identity, you can expand the square and what you'll see is you get first a term which is just the identity for Alice and for Bob and then you get another term which is the tensor product of commutators. So you get the commutator of A0 and A1 on Alice tensor product the commutator of B1 and B0 on Bob's system. So what is this commutator A0 A1? It's A0 times A1 minus A1 times A0. Same thing for the b's with 1 and 0 exchanged. All right, so now let's assume that we have observables and a state which achieve the optimal winning probability. So this means that if I look at optimum minus a half squared, this is 1 by 2 root 2 squared, it's equal to 1 8. And if I have an optimal strategy, it's going to be equal to this expression minus a half everything squared. So I'm, it's going to be equal to 1 by 64 times the norm of the CHSH squared operator, which is the same as the norm of the CHSH operator squared. Okay, so if I want this to hold, it means that the norm of CHSH squared should be equal to 64 by 8 should be equal to 8. Now my CHSH squared operator, I have it here. It has this term, which can contribute at most 4 to the norm, and this term, which can also contribute at most 4 to the norm, because these commutators they're the sum or the difference of these two operators, but these, because they square to identity, have norm at most one. So this here has norm at most one, this also. So the difference has norm at most two. And so I get at most two, at most two, I get four at most. So what this is saying is that achieving the optimum success probability is very constraining for the operators. All these inequalities must be satisfied to equality. In particular, if you want the norm of the commutator to be equal to two, the norm of this should be equal to 2, and the only way that this can be achieved is that A0, A1 should be equal to minus A1, A0. And also B0, B1 should be equal to minus B1, B0. Because you want these two terms to sort of interact constructively. And so if the second one is minus the first, then you get twice the first. And that's the only way you can hope to achieve a norm that's equal to 1. So that's the conclusion for now. Any strategy that achieves the optimum winning probability must be such that Alice's observables and the Bob observable anti-commute. That's what these conditions are. And we're soon going to see how powerful this is. First, let's look at a, another aspect of these strategies. The second ingredient that I want to use is so-called Jordan's lemma. This is a very powerful mathematical theorems. You could think of it about projections in high dimensional space. We can also think of it as a theorem about observables. So what the theorem says is that if you take any two observables, for example Alice's observables in the CHSH game, then you can always find a basis for the space on which these observables act such that they have a very simple form. They're simultaneously block diagonal. Moreover, these diagonal blocks have a special form. So I can always write, find a basis such that A0 looks like this, A1 looks like this, where I have maybe many such blocks here, two by two blocks. A0, I can always rotate the space so that it looks like this, one minus one, zero, zero, very simple. A1 will look like this, where theta 
is something that's called principal angle. So I can have many different thetas for different blocks, and these are the principal angles between these two observables. Geometrically, what are these principal angles? Where well, I drew an example for you here. So A0, A1 observables, you can think of them as reflections. So A0 reflects across the blue plane, and A1 reflects across the red plane. The principal angles, they're sort of the main angles between these spaces. In the case of my picture, they're planes. So I'm going to have two angles. One corresponds to this line here that's shared between the two planes. So that's going to be a principal angle theta that's equal to zero because they have a line in common. But once you put that line aside, then the second principal angle is going to be this angle here. That's going to be an angle that's a little bit above pi over two. So you have two principal angles, and these are the angles that will show up in this block decomposition. For our purposes, we don't need to know too much about this decomposition, aside from the fact that it has two by two blocks. And what this means is I can always write these two observables as the direct sum of two-dimensional strategies. I can do the same for Bob, and I can do the same for the state that they share. And the consequence is that the whole strategy, whatever it is, even if it uses a very high dimensional space that I know nothing about a priori, in fact, it really just boils down to a direct sum, meaning an incoherent superposition of single qubit strategies, where Alice has a qubit, Bob has a qubit, and that qubit corresponds to this two-dimensional space here. And this is extremely useful for the analysis because we had a high dimensional space, we didn't know what the dimension was, very complicated observables, huge matrices, but in fact, just because there's only two of them at Alice's side, two of them at Bob's side, everything boils down to a two-dimensional analysis. And then we're going to be able to wrap it up uh, very easily. And this is something that only works because there's two inputs per party in this game. Once there's more than two inputs, things become much more complicated. We don't want to go uh, in there. So let's stick with our CHSH game and wrap up the analysis. So recall what we've seen so far is that Alice's strategy, we can assume, is two-dimensional. And if it has to be an optimal strategy, her observables must anti-commute. And now the last step is just an observation. It's just saying that if you have two two by two Hermitian matrices that square to identity and anti-commute, then you can always find a basis in which the first one looks like a Z. And this was actually given to us by Jordan's lemma. And the second one looks like an X, meaning that the principal angle theta between the two of them in order to anti-commute must be pi over 4. So if you remember, this was cosine twice pi over 4, cosine pi over 2, that's 0, and then sine pi over 2, that's 1, so you get these here. How do you see this? Geometrically, let's just think of A0 as a reflection along a certain line. So A0 reflects here, and A1 reflects along a line that makes an angle pi over 4. So let's say that A1 goes this way. And now let's look at what happens if I take a certain point. For instance, I take this point, and let's apply A0 first. So I get reflected here, and then let's apply A1. I get reflected to that point here. So the image of this point is this point. That was if we do A0 first and then A1. Now if we do it the other way around, if we do A1 first, because we're on the line, we don't move, then we do A0 and we're switched to here. And so you can see that depending on the order in which we apply these operators, we end up either up here or the opposite, reflection with respect to the origin, here. And this is saying that the two observables anti-commute. And that's because the angle here, pi over 4. Okay? So that's just a geometric argument why we get the, this form for A0 and A1. And then the last thing that you want to observe is that because once we've set A0 and A1 to these values, in order to have equality in this inequality that we saw a couple slides ago, the only possible choice for B0, B1, and Psi is going to be things that up to a rotation on B's system are equivalent to the optimal strategy. So to get equality there, you need Psi to be up to a rotation on Bob's system, an EPR pair. 5 plus, and you need B0 to be the Hadamard matrix, and you need B1 to be this tilled Hadamard matrix that I introduced earlier. This is the optimal strategy. So there we are. We've characterized optimal strategies completely. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that suppose any strategy for these boxes that they implement achieves a winning probability, half plus 1 by twice root 2, then it must be the case that 
we take these arbitrary boxes, but in fact there exist some local isometries, U on Alice's side, B on Bob's side, that are such that what initially was an arbitrary tensor product of Hilbert spaces shared between these two devices, now I can rewrite in much simpler form. The A will just have a qubit tensored some remaining space that I don't really care about. B will also be a qubit, C2, tensor some remaining space, and such that up to these rotations, Alice's observables just look like z and x on the qubit, and they don't do anything on the auxiliary space. Bob's observables, Hadamar and tilde Hadamar, identity on the other spaces, and the state shared by them is equivalent to an EPR pair on the two qubits, tensored what I call here junk, just some remaining state that we don't really care about because the observables don't act on the state. So this is a very powerful characterization. If you remember from last week, we kind of saw a way to check that a state shared between Alice and Bob was an EPR pair by implementing this test that had two parts A and B, we measured in the same basis, checked the same outcomes. But the analysis of that test required us to know that we were measuring in certain bases, x and x, and z and z. Here I'm not making the assumption, this is why the CHSH test is more powerful. There's no assumption here. The initial state could be arbitrary, and the measurements could be arbitrary. I don't know that their qubit measurements could be very high dimensional, could be completely arbitrary. If they win in CHSH, then the state has this form. Now you can understand why the CHSH test is going to be so useful in order to obtain security in a quantum key distribution protocol, because it guarantees the presence of really the resource that we want to exist between Alice and Bob, a maximally entangled pair of qubits, because we know that due to monogamy, once their state is that state, then they're uncorrelated from anything else, including the eavesdropper. And that's going to form basis of the analysis of device-independent quantum key distribution that we're going to see in the following lectures.